In this short video, let's take an introductory look at Wiener processes. Now, Wiener processes don't have a dedicated chapter or reading in the FRM curriculum, but we do find applications of Wiener processes in FRM exam part 2 when we come to interest rate models. So, to understand Wiener processes in a pretty introductory kind of way, let's take a step back. Let's first understand what a stochastic process is in general. Think of a stochastic process to be a variable whose value changes over time in an uncertain way. So, to denote this stochastic process, we denote it as x subscript t, where x denotes my random variable and t denotes the time at which a particular value of the random variable has been observed. Now, this x can either be a discrete variable or it can be a continuous variable. This t, it can evolve or pass in a discrete way or the time can pass in a continuous way. Depending on this choice of discrete versus continuous, I can categorize stochastic processes into four camps. Discrete variable, discrete time. Discrete variable, continuous time. Continuous variable, discrete time. And continuous variable, continuous time. When it comes to now Wiener processes, I'll denote them as W subscript T and they fall in this category of continuous variable, continuous time. So let's do this. Let's now build our analysis of the Wiener process in as introductory a way as possible. And let's then in the end get down to the properties of this Wiener process. The only background knowledge that you would need to work out these properties is the set of properties of the normal distribution. Okay. So now let's do this. Let's start with a very convenient starting point. Let me assume that at time t equal to 0, my w, it starts at a value 0. Now, this tells me that whichever path I simulate for my w, all these paths, they have a common starting point and that starting point is 0 at time t equal to 0. Now, let's do this. Let's try and write down the logic which this w will follow when it comes to changes in the w over a very tiny time interval. Now, I have told you that w is continuous variable, continuous time. For a moment, let's assume that time is not continuous but rather discrete. Let me start at time t equal to 0 and for this complete time interval which starts from t equal to 0 and ends at time t equal to capital T, think of this capital T to be the horizon which I have in mind, let me discretize this entire time interval into a number of time steps. Each of these time steps, let us assume it's of duration or length delta t and let me assume that there are n such time steps. So, n times delta t gives me my capital T. Now, let's assume that at any point in time, which is lowercase t, the value or the level of my Wiener process is wt and the level at time t plus delta t is w subscript t plus delta t. Okay, The change in my Wiener process over this time interval from t to t plus delta t, let me denote it as delta w subscript t. So, subscript t means it's a period which begins at time t. Now comes the logic. How do I write down the change in my Wiener process over this time interval? I just chose any time interval from 0 to time t. Okay. To write down that change in my Wiener process, I have to keep two things in mind. The first thing is that the change in my Wiener process is by no means deterministic. The change is random and hence when I write down the logic behind this delta wt, I need to have a random component in it. That's number one. Number two, the change in my Wiener process over a time interval which is of a length or duration delta t, I need to also take this delta t into account. Smaller is my delta t smaller, intuitively speaking, should be the increment or change in my w. Okay? 
So therefore, let me write down this. Based on both of these components, component 1 was a random component, component 2 was some kind of a dependence or scaling that happens taking into account the delta t. So let me write down my delta wt as epsilon t, which is my random component, that times square root of delta t, that's my dependence with respect to the time step delta t, okay? This epsilon t is a standard normal variable, so it's normally distributed with zero mean and variance of one, and this epsilon t is serially uncorrelated. That means the epsilon which I choose to work out the increment in my wt from time t to time t plus delta t, I call it epsilon t, that epsilon t in no way depends on the epsilons which I chose for the previous time steps. Okay, So my epsilons are serially uncorrelated. I would need this property going forward. I started at time t equal to 0 at a value 0, that was my property 1. Then delta w, which is over this time interval from 0 to delta t, I would call that as delta w0. Remember in the subscript, I always put the time instant, which is the beginning of the interval. So here it is 0. So delta w0 is epsilon 0, the standard normal variate which I pick at time t equal to 0 scaled by square root of delta t. This then gives me the level of w at the first time slice, let's call it w at delta t, to be equal to w at time 0, which I know was a 0, plus the change in w, which was epsilon naught times square root of delta t. So my w at delta t becomes epsilon naught that times square root delta t. Let's move on to the next time slice. That's a time slice at time 2 delta t. This can be worked out by first working out the increment over this time step, the one which runs from delta t to 2 delta t. That increment I'll call it as delta w, delta t as subscript. This is the standard normal variate which was picked at time delta t that scaled by square root of delta t and this becomes w 2 delta t is equal to w at delta t the level at delta t plus the new increment which is epsilon delta t scaled by square root of delta t basically what this logic is telling me is that at every time time step i work out the increment or the change and I add that change to the previous level to arrive at the new level. So basically, when I finally reach my time slice t, which is my last time slice, the level of my Wiener process, wt, would be equal to the sum of all changes or increments that happened over all these time steps. So I can write it down as epsilon naught square root delta t plus epsilon delta t square root delta t all the way till the last epsilon which I picked and that was epsilon at t minus delta t that times square root of delta t. That's something which you have to remember from this page. Okay, let's move on. We made a choice. The choice was delta wt is equal to epsilon t scaled by square root of delta t. Let's take a look at what sort of distribution our delta wt will have. Epsilon t is standard normal distributed. I scale that epsilon t with square root of delta t and therefore it tells me that the expected value of delta wt will be equal to 0. It comes from this guy. The variance of delta wt will be equal to root delta t squared because it's a constant with which this random variable has been scaled. This times the variance of this guy, which I know is a 1. So variance of my delta wt is equal to delta t. Okay. Now, next step. Let's try and spend a moment as to why we chose this as our logic. Why didn't we choose some other logic such as delta wt is equal to epsilon t times just delta t. Why did we take a square root of delta t? Okay. To understand that, let's hypothetically do two checks. My first check is one in which 
I make my delta t smaller and smaller and let it approach a value 0. When that happens, then if I choose square root of delta t in my logic, then square root of delta t, it does die down to a 0 when delta t dies down to 0. But the speed at which square root of delta t dies down to 0 is much slower as compared to the speed at which delta t dies down to 0. Therefore, when I make my delta t go down to 0, which definitely I will, because I told you that only for a moment I made this assumption that time flows in a discrete way. It was just to highlight various properties of the Wiener process. In the end, I need to make time flow in a continuous way. And continuous flowing time means that any time increment which I talk about has to be that tiny that I can approximate it to be a zero. Okay. So this thing is bound to happen. And if this thing happens, and if there was a delta t sitting here, then delta wt would have actually gone down to zero very quickly. When delta wt would have gone down to zero that quickly, your Wiener process would have actually frozen. It would not have evolved over time. Okay, Just take a quick example. If delta t was, let's say, 0 0.01, square root of my delta t is actually 0 0.1. It's bigger than delta t. So therefore, the speed at which the square root of delta t goes down to zero is much slower and you do get some changes or increments in your Wiener process as your delta t becomes smaller and smaller. So no freezing happens. Next check, what if delta t was made to be large? If delta t was made to be large, square root of delta t does increase, yes, but its increase is actually at a much, much slower pace as compared to delta t. So based on this, we then impart this behavior on my Wiener process that it stays more or less contained. It does not really blow up as we keep moving forward in time. So based on these properties then, in the end, we have a few properties that we observe for the various parts of my Wiener process. My Wiener process, it has parts which are continuous. These are parts which can be drawn without lifting your pen. That means continuous parts. Parts of the Wiener process are pretty jagged and that's a behavior which you observe at any proximity. That means even if you were to zoom into a path of a Wiener process, you don't really arrive at straight lines. You always arrive at these jagged lines at whatever zoom level you actually watch this or observe this path at. And because of this guy, it's still finite. It doesn't blow up to infinity unless, let's say, you were to let time move to infinity. So if you really want to achieve an infinite value of W, time would really have to go till infinity. For a finite time horizon, t equal to capital T, w doesn't go out of bounds. Okay, So this was a few you know, set of properties of w based on the choice which I made for increments in w. Now let's do this. Based on this guy, you know, my delta wt and its distribution properties, let's work out the distribution of w as it stands at time t. Okay, This particular path of w leads me to this value of wt. If I were to simulate any other path, it might lead me to this value. A new path might lead me to this value. So wt is a random variable. At this time slice, it can arrive at any value on this time slice. Now let's take a look at what distribution would this random variable follow. My previous page, it told me that wt, you can think of it to be a number which you arrive at by accumulating many, many small increments in w. Each of these small increments came from an epsilon multiplied by a square root of delta t. So when I, all, when I add all these increments together, use the distributional assumption of each of these increments, I can arrive at the distribution of wt. The expected value of wt, very simple, is expected value of each of these increments added together. Each of these increments has a zero expected value, so the expected value of wt would also be a zero. 
the variance of wt would be equal to the variance of each of these increments remember i had told you the epsilons are serially uncorrelated so there won't be any covariance terms now for us to worry about and therefore the variance of wt as i just said is the sum of the variances of the individual increments and what it then tells me is that it will be equal to square root of delta t squared that times 1 plus 1 plus 1 n times so it becomes n times delta t which i know is capital t since my wt is a linear combination of many many normal variables put together the distribution of wt will also be normal and it tells me that wt follows a normal distribution with zero mean and variance as t it tells me that if i were to take two time slices one at t and let's say one which is somewhere here this is at some w you know at some t1 for example so it's wt1 so the distribution at capital t is a normal distribution zero mean and variance which is governed by t the variance is much lower at t1 so the mean here is still zero but the variance is lower okay so the dispersion of this distribution of wt1 is much less around the mean as compared to wt okay now look at this result i can actually extrapolate this result by looking at this result in a slightly different way when you take the Wiener process from time t equal to 0 to a time t equal to capital T, the Wiener process changes by an amount wt minus w0. This guy I know is a 0. This change in my Wiener process I am saying is normally distributed with 0 mean and with variance t minus 0. This result I can in general write it for the change in my Wiener process over any time interval which runs from t1 to t2 so my change would be given by w at t2 minus w at t1 and based on this result i can write down that this change will be a normally distributed random variable with zero mean and variance t2 minus t1 remember it was t minus zero here so t2 minus t1 last result and that is I can extend this fact that the WT is obtained by various increments put together right from its starting point to its ending point. If I were to pick two time intervals which are non-overlapping in nature, non-overlapping time intervals would mean that they don't share any increments in between them. Okay, Then I can draw this conclusion that if the two time intervals are one which runs from t1 to t2 and second one which runs from t2 to t3 then the change in my Wiener process over these two time intervals these two changes will be independent of one another because there are no common increments included in these two intervals okay so wt3 minus wt2 the change in the Wiener process that happens from t2 to t3 this random variable would be independent of the random variable which denotes the change in my Wiener process from t1 to t2 so that's wt2 minus wt1 okay so what we've done in this video is to take a look at the properties of the Wiener process and what we've done is that we have tried to let's say you know do some kind of sketchy proofs as to how we can substantiate these properties let me quickly recap the properties for you the ones which we've covered number one the Wiener process starts at time t equal to zero at a value zero number two the increment or changes in the Wiener process you can treat them as a normally distributed random variable with zero mean and variance equal to the length of that small time interval then we said that the terminal distribution the distribution of w at any time slice in future wt is a normal distribution zero mean variance equal to the time at which this terminal distribution is being plotted it's capital t the changes which happen for my wiener process over two time intervals which are non-overlapping in nature 
these changes denote two different random variables which are independent of one another okay there is no correlation between these two changes if they happen over two in non overlapping time intervals okay so this was a quick look at the wiener process